few items that I did write down. My beautiful wife and I were married at Camp Adair, Oregon, when I first went into the military service, which was an infantry outfit. Francis was very, very, very dominant to all the fellas in my post and my company. At that time, I don't know if any of you can remember, but everything was on ration. Francis and I had a little apartment, and therefore, she always wanted to get some of the fellas, not always the same, but some of the fellas out of the army barracks and come and invite them. The door was, there was a knock on the door and one of the chaps that were there went to greet the person that was knocking on the door. As the new guest came in, the chap that opened up the door said, oh, come, I want you to meet Jew Boy's wife, Francis. Jew Boy's wife, that was my name in the army. Jew Boy Cohen. I had a first sergeant by the name of Sergeant Cole. He was a cataract sergeant, which meant that he was train, training us doughboys that was first in the army. And everything that went on, as you know, some of the fellas would get weekend passes after basic training. Every single Monday, Sergeant Cole would report to me that, Cohen, you're on latrine duty. I don't have to tell you, with 180 men that went out on a weekend, what they looked like on Monday morning. The latrine, the bathroom, was unbearable. But Corporal, pardon me, Private Paul Cohn had that duty of cleaning up whatever. We went on bivouac one month, and it was for just, yes, one month. We go through problems of combat drilling, and after each and every operation, there's always a critique which means that we go through what we learned so in combat we would know what to do. As we are going along, I pulled my pack up and I was leaning against the mountain. Sergeant Cole came up to me and said, Cole, you're on company punishment for sleeping. Mm -hmm. Sergeant, I replied, I could tell you word for word of what this critique is all about. Took out his pad and again wrote, Private Cohn on duty, company punishment. When you're on duty, when you're on duty, we get our food cooked with four big ovens. What was my company duty when we got back to make those three onions, ovens shine like they were brand new? I don't have to tell you the work that was put into it with all kinds of soap, steel wool to get those things to perfection. Looked at the bulletin board and with 180 men in my company, you're only supposed to get KP like every other month. But when I looked at the bulletin board, my name was 
obviously there almost every week. Again, you had your choice when you were on KP. Either you do the dishes or you do the pots and pans. I chose to do the dishes. I completely done 180 plates, saucers, forks, knives, and spoons. When I got through, there's an officer on duty called the officer of the kitchen that has to inspect each and every thing and every plate. I was aware of that and I made sure there was not a speck of anything on that table. He took a half a dozen of dishes, forks, knives, and cups and threw them back into the dirty water and said, Cone, do it again. I just saw a speck of dirt on one of the dishes. And this one, ladies and gentlemen, I have to tell you, in my company, out of the 180 men, there were four Jews. One day, I entered the orderly room and the company commander said, Cone, pack your bags, you're shipping out at 1100 this morning. I asked him for permission to please let me call my wife so she can be sent home. No, I was not grant that position. I believe in faith and I can keep you here all night long telling you about Paul Cohn's faith when I was in the service. But however, Faith, believe me, believe me, believe in faith. What was the faith of this orderly room? There had to be another lieutenant sitting there listening to what was going on. And he said to the acting company commander, if you don't go out there and take that bulletin off of the board, I'm going to take you to the regimental commander and have you disbarred. Why? Captain Dugan, I believe, made that bulletin board outside of the orderly room with three steps and pulled that <coughs> bulletin off of the bulletin board. Four Jewish soldiers were designated to go to the Illusion Islands. I don't know if anybody knows the Illusion Islands is probably the coldest continent in the whole, whole world. Faith? Yes. This lieutenant told this acting commander to go out there and pull that bulletin off of the wall and why? Believe it or not, ladies and gentlemen, those names on that bulletin board were supposed to be volunteer names. But instead, Captain Collins put four Jews on there to be shipped out. Paul, save some. Yes. I don't want to all the good stuff at once. <laughs> and that's my story. I am 95 years old. I was in the first wave into Lady Island. I was the first soldier when you just saw on the film General Douglas MacArthur entering Lady saying, I have returned. I happened to be about 100 feet away from General MacArthur when he returned to the Philippines, Lady Island. And when he approached me, I looked up. What do you do with a four-star general? I'm digging my foxhole, 
And so therefore, what do I do? So I jumped up, and the first words to a GI dig in the foxhole, that's all right, soldier, carry on. Thank you for listening. Wow, what a guy. I, um, <clears throat> I come from a family of uh, fighters, uh, some of it official, some of it unofficial. My father and his friends during the 1930s formed a gang in Chicago called the Davy Miller Gang. They're all tough guys. My dad was a football player at what was then a big time football school, the University of Chicago. And uh, Chicago was a German city. Everybody thinks of it as an Irish city. But uh, until the Second World War, the Germans ran the town. The mayors were all German. And the Bund, the German-American Bund, was a big part of the town. And my father and his buddies, armed with baseball bats, used to go to places like the Germania Club in Chicago and beat the crap out of the Nazis. <laughs> Chicago being Chicago, they took care of the police beforehand, so the police never intervened. When uh, the war broke out or in Europe, uh, two years before the United States got into it, my dad and his friends wanted to fight Hitler, and they joined the Royal Canadian Air Force so they could get into the game. To, it was two years before Pearl Harbor. After Pearl Harbor, they were all transferred into American units. Um, he, uh, after the war, uh, we followed uh, the uh, practice of all around the country of Jews moving out of the ghettos and the cities, build a house and buy a house in Highland Park, Illinois, which is a, about comparable to Beverly Hills here, although further out from the city. And uh, first night we went to bed, the war was still on by the way, it was in uh, uh, the summer of 1945. Went to bed, woke up in the morning and our neighbors had planted on our lawn, Jews get out of Highland Park, signs all over the place. Jews go back to Chicago. My dad took my six year old brother in one hand and my eight year old hand in his and we walked to the beach. It was uh, really more like Malibu than uh, Beverly Hills. It was right on Lake Michigan with a big bluff uh, and, and uh, very much uh, like Malibu with fresh water rather than salt water. We walked up to the gate to our beach and an armed guard was standing there and he asked my father if he was a member of the North Deer Park Improvement Association. And I learned as an eight-year-old that the association of the words improvement and real estate meant no Jews allowed. So my father said uh, he'd never heard of the North Shore Park Improvement Association, but he was a lawyer and he had bought a house with riparian property and he was going to use the beach. And so the guard laboriously looked through the list of names and finally came up with a question are you a Hebrew or a Negro because they're not allowed to use this beach? So my dad grabbed him by his Sam Brown belt and his shirt, walked over to the top of the bluff and tossed him. Oh. And the guy rolled, rolled oh. down <laughs> the beach. And at the bottom of the beach were our neighbors who had hired him. Uh, okay. It was a rent a cop. And uh, we, went down the, we went down to the, uh, the beach and went swimming. And uh, those who couldn't stand us put their houses up for rent and moved further away. And the ones who stayed became good friends. But that was Ed Stackler's way, and it was a way that inspired uh, me and things that I had done. Greg Lee, you were uh, fighting in uh, Vietnam. What was the experience like in Vietnam some, wow, some 20 years, uh, 20 Five, thirty years after you got to go back yeah, after, oh, after the Second World yeah. War. No, no. You, you know, you're right. Hey, I, before I answer that, I have to tell you. Notice how I position myself right between the two tough guys, right? Because <laughs> I don't want to. You no, know, you're going to be okay. You know, I, my experience was a little bit different. I, I was very fortunate to serve with uh, uh, some pretty special units where we didn't really 
care what religion you were, what race you were, or any of that kind of thing. We had a job to do, and we looked out for each other. However, what I will tell you is, during the training and whatnot, I, coming right here from Southern California, I, I got there, and you know, I grew up with lots of Jews and whatnot, and in my units, in my training units, there, there was a handful of Jews. The biggest question somebody would say is, do y'all celebrate Thanksgiving? Some Oklahoma <laughs> boys would say, do y'all celebrate Thanksgiving? <laughs> I say, yeah, we do that. We definitely do that. Uh, we, we, uh, the kind of uh, prejudice that we experienced in, in those uh, 60s and 70s was, was against the blacks. The, the blacks seemed to uh, have their clique, and uh, white people seemed to have their clique. The Jews weren't really the big deal there, so I, I, I escaped it. I was fortunate. Let me comment on that. Uh, there's a gentleman here that I invited because uh, he's one of my heroes. Uh, he was a tank commander in the Israeli army during the second war with Lebanon. Pretty macho, I see you on top of the tank. You probably had your shirt open, Ron, you know, and waving, I'm the commander. A hell of a battle. And he got the wounds of battle. He's the other wheelchair in the house tonight. And uh, Ron Weinrich came out of the service and started a whole new career and wondered if somebody in a wheelchair could make it as an entertainer, as a songwriter, as a performer. And he tried delicately in Israel. And to his surprise, he became a superstar, real superstar. But I did find out, Rabbi, that a superstar in music in Israel works a few bar mitzvahs, maybe a wedding, <laughs> and in Hollywood. So my friend, former tank commander, Ron Weinrich is here in LA and enjoying the launch of a great new career. Gotta thank you, my friend, for your service, please. <laughs> I wanna tell you what the plans are for the film before I give this back uh, to Ron. Uh, this film will be seen on national television on February 21st, uh, on public television. This film will be seen in screenings uh, by synagogues and temples and churches and associations uh, throughout the country, uh, made possible by uh, representative sponsors, people like Ron and Shell, uh, who are in those towns. Uh, we are also using it as a fundraiser for Jewish war veterans uh, to raise the money, not only for the cost of this, but to fight anti-Semitism. Nobody on the screen, nobody is being paid anything. It's just the actual cost of production, the clearance of tapes, and everything else. So with that, uh, uh, Ron, somebody asked me, gentleman in the back asked me, what does a Medal of Honor get beside the Medal of Honor? Uh, I should have answered you earlier. A Medal of Honor recipient, and by the way, I'll buy the best suit in Beverly Hills or the Valley for anybody who can tell me the exact number of veterans living in the United States tonight and how many Medal of Honor recipients, we don't say winners, recipients, no one went out to win a race. How many recipients? Anybody want a new suit, new hat, new dress, briefcase? Mine's no tries. Oh yeah, shut up. <laughs> there are 18,400,000 veterans living in the United States today. 18,400,000. 76 received the Medal of Honor. One of them is Jack Jacobs, our living Jewish Medal of Honor recipient. We're very proud of him. He's going to be helping us introduce this project as we go around the country. Okay, Rob. Greg, I wonder if I can ask you a follow-up question about um, how the um, Medal of Honor winners portrayed in the movie were selected. 
I, I, if I understand your question, basically the process to receive a Medal of Honor is to be nominated or to be recommended by through the chain of command. And so all of these people distinguished themselves during their, their service and they were recommended by their chain of command with the exception of some of the ones that you've seen that were delayed. For instance, Tibor Rubin, he, he was not recommended. Uh, so in, in that situation, the Jewish War Veterans, uh, our organization, we were well aware of Tibor Rubin. He'd been a member, in fact, he was a, member, a very good friend of mine, a member of my own local post in Orange County for many years. And, and we just did the grind. It's a big grind. You saw Scott Abrams here. He told you about how uh, Congressman Brad Sherman helped get uh, the Medal of Honor for, for Ben Solomon. And it's a similar kind of process with Tibor Rubin and anybody that was overlooked. We go and we find a friendly congressperson and we lobby and we grind and we persist, just like what Jewish people do. We just keep coming and we don't quit. Let me add to that if I may. Uh, I didn't answer your question uh, in the back. In addition to the Medal of Honor, each recipient gets an additional pension of $1,250 over and above whatever they're normally getting, a 10% raise in uh, their existing pension or medical benefits, a clothing allowance, uh, free flying on any military aircraft from any military base, and without a congressional appointment, if they're academically qualified, their children can go to any of the uh, military academies. And there is a Medal of Honor a Society that we are working very closely with, because when we're done, when we're done, every, all of this will, will be appearing not only at their headquarters, but at the National Jewish Military Museum in Washington, D.C., uh, which is uh, run by uh, the Jewish War Veterans Organization. Uh, I want to watch our time. Somebody's got a question. Yes? Uh, one more thing. Arlington. They are oh, I'm sorry. You're absolutely right. Thank you for correcting me. Arlington, uh, they are automatically uh, entitled to be buried at Arlington. I should tell you, uh, and again, I mentioned Chase Manley earlier. When we began trying to identify the Jewish, the American Jewish heroes, and we went back and forth on that, Jewish American heroes, American Jewish heroes, we left it that way. Uh, we found different lists. Actually found one list with 30 names on it. Uh, I found two people that had been identified by the White House. Uh, President Obama called the nephew of a recipient to congratulate him on his late uncle's now getting the Medal of Honor with an apology for the delay due to his Jewish faith. And the nephew told us, he said, thank you very much, Mr. President. We will be there, but we're all Catholics, sir. <laughs> and they hung up, so even the White House made a mistake on it. Uh, it it's a very unusual situation. We are in the process of getting permission to go to Arlington where one Jewish Medal of Honor recipient is and has a, a cross and hopefully it'll be replaced with Star David and a Medal of Honor uh, plaque, uh, which we are looking very good. Uh, Greg Lee uh, is a very modest guy. Uh, he led the fight uh, to rename the Long Beach uh, Veterans Hospital and Congress has now acted on it and we're within inches of it being renamed for Tibor Rubin, who was not only a patient, but went back there to be a volunteer. In the back, yeah. Yeah, can you clarify for me, please? Uh, you said that there are about 18 million or more veterans in the United States. Yes. And then you mentioned about 70-some uh, Medal of Honor recipients. Living, yes. Living. Uh, is it the total amount of Medal of Honors or Jewish veterans? No, there's only one Jewish Medal of Honor recipient alive today. He's one of 76 Medal of Honor recipients. 76 total. Total. Who's the non -Jew? Total. 75 non Jewish okay. and one Jewish. Thank you. Thank living, you. Living. Anybody else have a question or a comment? I lied. Oh, I lied. Just, no, but just to clarify, saying how many were there, t were there total? I'm sorry, what? How many Jews have received the Medal of Honor in total? Wikipedia says... 17 Jews. Well, let me give you the history. 
Prior to the last year of the Civil War, the only medal that existed was the Medal of Honor. It was given out to 1,700 people in the first couple of years of the Civil War. They then created all the other medals and elevated the Medal of Honor to what we now know as the Congressional Medal of Honor. It was awarded, since that time it's gone to 1,600 people. Of those 1,600, we have 17 that we know of from Civil War since right up to current times. Uh, there are a, a couple of other investigations going on right now to determine whether or not anyone was denied the Medal of Honor because they were Jewish, because they were black, because they were Hispanic. So this is an organic project. It will grow as others are presented. I think we got to wrap it. <laughs> thank you, members of the panel. Thank you, audience, uh, for being here. I have to just one, one more anecdote. It was said at some point during the movie uh, that there were people who wanted to be Jewish in the army to get kosher food. As a criminal defense lawyer, I had several clients who went, I lost cases and they wound up in the joint, um, stated they were Jewish so they could get kosher food. My last one is up in Lompoc today and uh, he claims he's Jewish, he doesn't know what to think about you. <laughs> All right. Well, you know, we had a, a great evening here tonight, and I look out at the, the audience, and I can see everybody's ready to go home, and so we're not going to keep you here longer, and we want to thank you for coming. I, I know this production is going to be a great tool to end bigotry and to install some pride into our, our communities. One of the things that I learned throughout my Jewish studies is that Hashem up there likes partners. And, and Hashem has made all of us his partners here in the physical world. He's, he's, he's actually tasked us with a mitzvah, and that mitzvah is called tikkun olam, repairing the world. And I think everybody who worships with Rabbi Brisky is well aware of that and lives it. And just as Hashem has asked us to be his partner in tikkun olam, we, the Jewish war veterans, we want to ask you to be our partner in true honor. You saw the production, and yes, you can be a partner in this production, much like how you might sponsor a Torah portion for that new scroll at the shul. We are inviting you to partner with us by sponsoring either a segment, a screening, a city, even a quote. All of our partners will receive their own copy of the finished production, <coughs> And all of our partners will receive permanent screen credit acknowledging their participation. So wherever this is shown, your name will appear. And it's really easy to become a partner. People say, how do I do that? How do I get to be a partner? Well, you simply go to the website. And the website's on your program. It's written right there, caljwv.org. And you go there, and, and if you just type in that exact address, it'll take you right to the True Honor page. You can even see another little screening of, of just a clip of True Honor. And there's a little button there you can push, and it's a donation button. And if you feel inspired and you would like to make one, we'll certainly accept it cheerfully. And there's no minimum amount. However, I will tell you that if you, you hit a certain level, you, you too can be an executive producer. You can be a benefactor. You can be more than a partner. Who doesn't want to be a producer of a movie? Yeah. I tease you. But that, that all does exist, and, and it's really not funny. I try to be a little bit lighthearted, but this is a serious project, and, and I don't want to make light of it. it. It really is serious, and we certainly would like your help and your sponsorship. And, well, you know what? When a guy like this tells me he wants the microphone, I have to give it to him because he's yeah. a tough guy. Ladies and gentlemen, freedom is not free. God bless America. Thank you. You need it back. Thank you, folks.